Hey guys, how you guys doing today? Thanks for uh, being here and thanks to the AWE conference for having me. It's an absolute thrill to be at a conference that shares the same name as my popular YouTube series. So it's a thrill to be here with you guys. So again, my name is Jason Silva and I am the host of National Geographic's Brain Games TV series which means I have a passion for the way we perceive the world and the way in which we misperceive the world and the ways in which we can manipulate our own perception of the world, which extends to a passion for virtual reality and augmented reality and all the ways in which we can steward the contents of our consciousness. I'm also the host of the new Nat Geo series, Origins, The Journey of Humankind, which is about the coevolution of humans and technology, the way in which technology has had an instrumental role in transforming our species. We are truly in a coevolution with our tools. As the philosopher Marshall McLuhan used to say, we build the tools and then the tools build us. And I'm really passionate about that feedback loop, the way in which everything that we design in the world ultimately designs us in return. So we are really designing ourselves when we build tools and innovations in the world. So I have a passion for human imagination. I have a passion for human creativity. And this has turned to a passion for technology and innovation. And the reason for that is because ultimately technology is the embodiment of human creativity in the world. Technology is the literalization of human imagination in the world. As the philosopher Terence McKenna used to say, technology is how we turn the human mind inside out and how we ultimately impregnate the world with the content of our minds. And it has always been so, right? This is the human story. The cognitive philosophers, David Chalmers and Andy Clark, Cognitive philosophers actually describe technology as a scaffolding of mind that we use to extend our thoughts, our reach, and our vision. And there's historical precedence for this, right? 100,000 years ago, in the savannas of Africa, when early humans first picked up a stick on the ground to reach a fruit on a really high tree, we've been using our tools, we've been using our instruments to extend our reach, to extend our agency, right? To transcend and overcome our limits. That's what we've always done. Now, today we're living in a transformative age. We're living in an age of technological disruption. We're living in an age in which it feels as if the rug is being pulled from underneath our feet. We're, the, we're living in the age of acceleration. We're living in the age of exponential change. But technology has always been disruptive. It's just that these disruptions used to happen over many generations. Back in the day, you know, you were born and you died and the world didn't really change very much. The changes accrued again over many generations. Today, it's very different because today we're feeling the changes within our own lifetimes, right? We, we have literally <laughs> come to a moment in which we can no longer defer the transformations and say, oh, they'll deal with it. Our children and our grandchildren will be dealing with it. We're living within it now. And of course, the reason for this in Silicon Valley vernacular is because of Moore's law, it's because of exponential change. It's because again, we used to live in a world that was linear and local, and now we live in a world that is global and that is exponential. But our brains are still wired to think about change in a linear fashion. Our brains are still wired, our intuition is still to think about change in a linear fashion. But again, technological change is exponential. Now, one of the godfathers of technology, Ray Kurzweil, he has a great example to illustrate the difference between linear change, which is what our intuition continues to be, right? And exponential change, which is the world that we're living in today where information technology is literally transforming what it means to be human. And the example that Kurzweil loves to use, and I'm sure you guys have heard it before, but I might as well repeat it because it's very important to get this in your head so that you can make sense of what's happening today. He calls it the 30 steps example. So if you take 30 linear steps, one, two, three, four, five. By step 30, you get to 30. That's linear change. Hey, right, you take 30 steps, you get to 30. Duh, boring. That's not the world we live in today. If you take the same amount of steps, if you take 30 steps, but you take those 30 steps exponentially, right? Two, four, 16, by step 30, you're at a billion. So take that in for a second, right? 30 linear steps gets you to 30. 30 exponential steps gets you to a billion. And we're living in the world of exponential technological change. This is the reason why the smartphone in our pocket 
is a million times cheaper, a million times smaller, and a thousand times more powerful than what used to be a $60 million supercomputer that was half a building in size 40 years ago. And the reason all of this becomes possible is on the back of this kind of exponential transformation. Again, the tool you take for granted in your pocket is a million times cheaper, a million times smaller, and a thousand times more powerful than something that used to be half a building in size 40 years ago and cost 60 million bucks, right? And these exponential curves are not stopping. In the next 25 years, this will shrink down to the size of a blood cell. It'll be inside our bodies and brains, reverse engineering us from inside out. This is not changing. Today, a young kid with a smartphone in rural Africa has better communications technology than a head of state had 25 years ago. The tools to change the world are now in everybody's hands. The supercomputers of yesterday are now in everybody's hands. So I feel the most important element here is to understand why this is happening. The nature of exponential progress should get you thinking exponentially rather than think, Oh my God, things are changing so fast, I can't keep up. I'm terrified, the computers are gonna take over my job. People are gonna live in virtual video game universes and they're not gonna to talk to each other. No, instead, it's an exponential opportunity for reinvention, for transformation, for evolution, to become something more, to extend the faculties of our minds, to think bigger than we've ever thought before. Everything good and great begins at the edge of our comfort zone. Everything transformative and innovative we've ever done required us to think radically outside the box. We're gonna build machines and we're gonna go inside of them and fly through the sky across the ocean. We're gonna make devices made of plastic and metal that are gonna allow us to send our thoughts across time and space. Like, We've already engineered the impossible. We've already engineered the miraculous. In fact, now we take it for granted and we complain when the Wi-Fi drops on the airplane. Like, shit's crazy. We gotta get our heads to think exponentially. This is crucial to dissolve those mental models that have prevented us from thinking bigger, to move beyond the been there's and done that's of the adult mind and see the world as if through the eyes of a child that sense of first sight unencumbered by knowingness. Think bigger than ever before. So I'm a digital filmmaker, I'm a storyteller. In addition to working with National Geographic, I have this series called Shots of Awe, which is aiming to get people to think big, right? To dissolve their mental models, to open themselves up, to crack themselves open to new possibilities. And I'd like to show you a couple of these videos today as we have a conversation about augmenting our world and augmenting ourselves because the augmented reality revolution is just a continuation of, again, the, the pattern of us augmenting our world and augmenting ourselves with our tools, which again is what's, what we've always done. So the first video I wanna show you today is called To Be Human is To Be Transhuman. So in the back, if you can please play the first video. So there's a great line by Shakespeare in which he says, we know what we are, we know not what we may be. And in the age of accelerating technologies in which we extend the cognitive reach of our minds, the perimeters of our humanness with these extensions of self, these exoskeletons, these technological scaffoldings, you know, the wings of our aircrafts and the signals traveling through our smartphones, sending our thoughts electrified at the speed of light across oceans of sky. We redefine and extend what it means to be human. Edward O. Wilson says, we have actually decommissioned natural selection and now we must look deep within ourselves and decide what we wish to become. We are now the chief agents of evolution. We have reversed engineered the software of biology and about to rewire and upgrade and redefine what it is to be a homo sapien. Juan Enriquez uses the term homo evolutus, the being that evolves itself, that transforms itself, right? Ray Kurzweil, we didn't stay in the caves. We haven't stayed on the planet. Biology, just another membrane to be transcended. You know, Marvin Minsky used to say, will robots inherit the earth? 
Yes, they will, but they will be our children. You know, I love this idea because we hear the term transhumanism, and what it means to be human is to be transhuman. We are the species that transforms and transcends. We never stopped, we always did. It's what we are. So we have this unique capacity to overcome our limits. We have this unique capacity to create tools in the world that literally allow us to transcend our own boundaries. And on the back of these information technologies, we have transformed ourselves. So far, so good. People, you know, it takes them a, a beat, but then they're like, I believe it because I've seen it. We've seen our computers shrink down to devices in our pockets. We're witnessing these transformations day in and day out. But what about the world of flesh and concrete? The world in which we are embodied physical beings <laughs> in spaces that have to be built Right, And certainly that's not changing exponentially, people say. Well, it turns out those things are also about to change exponentially because those things are also becoming information technologies. So biotech, right? Biotech means mastering the information processes of biology because it turns out that we are made of language. We are linguistic all the way down. DNA is code, right? And this code is increasingly coming under conscious control. We are learning to program the coding of life. And the speed at which we are sequencing our genes now, gene sequencing is accelerating three times faster than Moore's law. That means three times faster than these exponential numbers I was just talking about before. The eminent physicist Freeman Dyson, he envisions a very near future where a new generation of artists are gonna be writing genomes with the fluency that Blake and Byron and Shakespeare wrote verses, right? Think about that for a second. We're gonna make poetry out of the coding of life. What does that mean? It means we're gonna be downloading patches for biology the same way we download patches for our iOS applications. Already, the XPRIZE Foundation created the medical tricorder XPRIZE to see who could create a smartphone-sized device that could diagnose you better than 10 board-certified doctors. They call it lab-on-a-chip technologies. I mean, we are literally beginning a revolution that's going to transform healthcare. We're going to enter the age of personalized medicine. We're going to enter the age of synthetic biology. And the advancements in this space, again, are going to be happening at an exponential rate. This has not escaped the minds of Silicon Valley. There's a reason why Google's Larry Page founded Calico, the California Life Extension Company, a software company for biology. There's a reason he got a Time Magazine cover story called Google and the End of death. And there's a reason why so many Silicon Valley billionaires are saying the next, the next space to hack is inner space, because we want to transcend the ultimate, the ultimate evil and entropy, which is death. And again, this is the next space. Biotechnology is going to change the game. It's going to be a trillion dollar industry. It's going to change everything. Then, of course, we have the world of concrete, nanotechnology, will be the, finally the technology that allows us to turn the built environment into, into a programmable language. Nanotechnology allows us to pattern atoms, the building blocks of the physical world, the same way we pattern ones and zeros in digital technology. The seminal book on nanotech is called Engines of Creation, and that's literally what nanotechnology will allow us to do, to harness the engines of creation to have software that writes its own hardware, to literally make the physical world programmable, right? Terence McKenna used to say, we live inside of the condensation of human imagination. I said before, technology turns the human mind inside out. Well, increasingly, technologies like nanotech and biotech, and of course, continuing advances in artificial intelligence, these three overlapping revolutions potentially will lead us toward a kind of technological singularity, which will allow us to, allow us to transcend all previous limits. This is a game-changing idea, but increasingly, <laughs> when we see what's becoming possible, it seems less far-fetched than we thought. I remember when Craig Venter was asked about his synthetic organism, the first artificial life form. And the people said to him, are you worried that you're playing God? And he said, who's playing? <laughs> because this is, this is really the space that we're going to. So you have biotech, you have nanotech, you have artificial intelligence, and artificial intelligence will continue to allow us to offload cognitive processes to non-biological props and scaffoldings, making us increasingly a cyborgian species, right? 
And if you really think about it, some of the smartest cognitive philosophers, people like David Chalmers, people like Andy Clark, in their extended mind thesis, when they wrote about smartphones and computers as literally extensions of human cognition, these guys say, we make a mistake in assuming that the human enterprise ends at the edge of our skin tissue. And they actually say that the mind emerges in the feedback loops between brains, tools, and environments. So we are already a distributed being. We are already intelligence that is distributed between biological and non-biological parts. We are a hybrid, we are a cyborg. And this next video looks a little bit at what is required to conceive and conceptualize of what becomes possible on the back of these changes. I think it was, um, yeah, it was also Marshall McLuhan who used to say that it's always been the artist who realizes that the future is the present and uses his work to prepare the grounds for it. So please show the next video, the future of us. So let's talk about the future of us. What does that even mean, the future of us? It's a look at what comes next. It's a look at what might be. Because today, exponentially emerging technologies are transforming what's possible. They are helping us overcome, transcend, even biological limitations. The very rules of what it is to be human are up for grabs. We're rewriting the software of life with biotechnology. We're turning matter into a programmable medium with nanotechnology. We're creating sentient minds with artificial intelligence that are not bound by the limitations of biology. These three overlapping revolutions, GNR, genetics, nanotechnology, and robotics, together will be leveraged to lead us towards a black hole-like, impossible to fathom singularity. It's like staring into the sun. A moment of a rousing symphonic climax when all of mind leverage the network together transcends its biological origins and we become something more. People worry about the AIs and the them. Well, as Kurzweil says, that's gonna be us. The future of us is ours to dream up. Yeah, crazy, right? Thanks, guys. <laughs> Um, now, ultimately, I'm a storyteller. I'm an artist. You know, I'm not an academic. I'm not an engineer. I leave that to you guys. I mean, you guys are the ones that are creating and refining these tools. You guys are the ones that make this all possible. And when we talk about things like virtual reality, we talk about things like augmented reality, these things are going to change the game because they're going to change the nature of conscious experience. They're going to change phenomenology. They're going to change the spaces in which our minds dwell. And this is a very exciting thing. There was a very interesting article by Yuval Harari, the author of Sapiens and Homo Deus, where he talked about finding meaning in a future without work. And he's one of these guys that says it like it is. He's saying, yeah, look, the majority of jobs are going to go away. There'll be new jobs that are created, but on the back of exponential tech and AI, there's probably going to be the rise of a useless class, which is an economically useless class, which is a group of people that basically cannot contribute to an economy in which most things are done by algorithms. And so he predicts that a large majority of these people are going to spend more of their time in virtual worlds, and that this is not necessarily a bad thing. Because first and foremost, he says, and others have echoed, people like Robert Anton Wilson, who's spoken about the reality tunnels in which we live. All realities are virtual, first and foremost. We, and in brain games, we used to talk about this. We can't ever know any kind of objective reality. All we know is the consensual hallucination known as human culture. All realities are virtual, right? Culture is a virtual reality. Language informs the way you see the world. The, the, the world. Clothing that you wear can inform your political views. You put on a uniform and all of a sudden you see the world different. So all realities are virtual. All realities are mediated. Get on a plane and go across the world and hang out with somebody from a different religion or a different culture and you'll see they're literally running a different operating system. They're literally living within a different OS. Realities are linguistic. Realities are all virtual. But this doesn't make them any less legitimate. Once you're invested in a virtual environment, it has real human meaning because we are the creators of meaning in a meaningless world. So there's nothing artificial or disingenuous about investing ourselves in virtual worlds. We've always done it. What it means to be human is to create a world of mind and meaning and invest ourselves in it. 
This is the reason why I have no moral problem whatsoever with virtual and augmented reality. If anything, my call to action is for us to create virtual worlds that are beyond anything we've ever made before, beyond the greatest movie, beyond the best novel, beyond the greatest tales and stories we've ever heard around the campfire. The challenge with VR and AR is to exceed ourselves, is to go beyond where we've ever gone before, is to transform the way we interface with world and with ourselves. In fact, Terrence McKenna, another one of my heroes who I've mentioned a couple times already, he used to say, with VR and even AR, the transformation of human intimacy is where things get really exciting. Right now, we have a pretty low fidelity technology called language to try to communicate the contents of our minds, right? I'm like, I really love you. I love you like the heart. I love you like the sky. Like, it's a pretty rudimentary like voice vibrations, you know, encode information within my mind, send it to you, hopefully you decipher it, hopefully you get what I'm saying, hopefully you get some kind of semblance of the contents of my own mind, right? It's, but again, it's a low resolution technology. When language fails us, we turn to poetry, we make music, right? We make paintings, we make movies, which perhaps thus far is the greatest, most high fidelity communication technology. Movies, I think, cinema allows us to step into somebody else's shoes. Cinema allows us to experience the world within the mind of somebody else. It's perhaps the greatest technology of intersubjectivity. But again, with VR, when you want to get intimate with somebody, you get to go inside their mind. With VR, you get to go inside the cosmos of somebody else's mind, embodied, full 360, fully immersed within the creative universe that somebody else has made. So the potential for intersubjective intimacy, the potential to know one another's deepest aspects is game-changing. But again, it's up to us what we do with these tools. We could make it so that it transform interpersonal communication. We can make VR and AR universes that bring us closer together, that fundamentally enlarge our compassion, enlarge our empathy, or we could use it to play stupid shoot 'em up games, right? This next video, which I'm premiering here for the first time, is about augmented reality specifically and about the beauty of creating a second layer of mind, putting it on top of the world as it exists today. Please show the next video. One of the most fascinating and emerging fields right now is the field of augmented reality, which raises, I think, all kinds of metaphysical questions about reality to begin with. I mean, we know from neuroscience that reality is coupled to perception, and we know from neuroscience that perception is skewed. So the reality within which we live normally, that analog reality, still has built-in cognitive slippages and biases, not to mention the cultural reality tunnel within which we live, not to mention the language we speak all these things inform our world. So what is real? Let's start with that. We don't even know. But there's no reason why we can't in turn augment what is already mediated by perception. And this is where augmented reality comes into play. It's a second skin. It's a second layer that we wear on top of our bodies, freeing us from the limitations of biology, making the world an extension of mind, making the world our mind turned inside out, where interesting wisdom, knowledge, tidbits, its stimulation, novelty, is fed a la carte, on demand, served up for your frontal lobe, serendipitously, enchanting the world, impregnating the world with a kind of magic. As I imagine, so it becomes, and this is the very essence of magic. So augmented reality, it'll change everything. It'll be the beginning of what Terence McKenna says, human beings, humanity, moving into the imagination, inhabiting the imagination. Now I realize that this interpretation of augmented reality is a bit utopian. There's a kind of dreamy quality to this beautific vision that I'm painting for you, but we, there's enough doom and gloom, there's enough scare and despair out in the mediascape today, so why not imagine all the ways in which these instruments could be used Used to increase the fidelity of the human experience. More love, more awe, more wonder, more serendipity, more curiosity, more of it all, my friends. So let's do this. Let's build this world. Let's upgrade our consciousness. The augmented reality revolution, my friends, could be the beginning of such a dream. Thanks, guys. Now, I call my videos Shots of Awe 
because I'm kind of an awe junkie. One of my heroes, Carl Sagan, he coined the term wonder junkie when he wrote the novel Contact before it was turned into the Jodie Foster film. And I think, you know, whether you're a wonder junkie or an awe junkie, it just means that there is the constant hunger for transformation. There is a constant hunger for understanding. There is a constant hunger for something else, for something more. And, you know, I describe awe as an exhilarating neurostorm of intense intellectual pleasure. Carl Sagan used to say, understanding is a kind of ecstasy. And there's been some studies out of Stanford University, out of Berkeley, on the subject of awe, appropriate for a conference called awe. And in these studies, they described experiences of awe as experiences of such perceptual expansion, right? Perceptual vastness that you're forced to reaccommodate your mental models of the world, your mental models of the possible in order to assimilate the experience. Now, there's this sense, I've, took, I've talked before, of the, the been there's and done that's of the adult mind. The jadedness that comes as we get older and we feel like we've seen it all before. Our nodding resignation into nothingness when nothing impresses us, nothing turns us on, nothing gets us out of our comfort zone, right? And it turns out that experiences of awe, whether they be the first time you see the Grand Canyon or you witness the birth of a child or you embark on an ayahuasca ceremony, whatever it may be, you're exposed to something that is so far beyond your conceptual frameworks that finally you're cracked open and the light can get in or the light can get out, whatever you wanna call it. And it turns out that these experiences of awe leave us with lasting cognitive benefits. So after the temporary experience of awe, you're left with increased feelings of well-being, increased feelings of compassion, increased feelings of creativity, increased feelings of empathy, not to mention that the experience of awe acts as an anti-inflammatory on your physiology. So getting, blown, getting your mind blown is good for you, right? As Timothy Leary used to say, in order to use your heads, you've got to go out of your mind. Now, yeah. Now, this, the, the potential here to create awe modules, you know, to combine things like sensory deprivation floating tanks with high-definition LED screens or wearable helmets that allow us to completely leave our bodies behind and have out-of-body transformative awe experiences means that the future of psychotherapy, the future of introspection, the future of how we cultivate wellness and the self could be radically transformed on the back of virtual reality and augmented reality. I mean, this is game changing. I remember reading an article by Ross Anderson called GoldenEye, and it was about the new James Webb telescope and also about the Hubble Space Telescope. And he was talking about some of the implications of what will be made possible. You know, he was talking about how the Space Telescope allows us to mainline space and time through the optic nerve. I mean, think about that, that's really what's happening. When we look upon the deep field photographs, right, the Hubble deep field photographs of the universe, and we're able to fathom, we're able to hold in mind what we're looking at, that is mainlining space and time through the optic nerve. Or as Ross Anderson says, the sheer aesthetic force of its discoveries, right, distills the complex abstractions of astrophysics into singular expressions of color and light that vindicate Keats' famous couplet, beauty is truth and truth is beauty. So I read something like that and I'm like, I love language for its poetic rhapsody, its capacity to capture the ineffable, but that's just language and those are just images. Imagine a VR or AR experience that gives people the chance to swallow the cosmos. Imagine all of us being like Jodie Foster in contact, going through the wormhole to another galaxy at the end of time and taking all that in. This is what excites me. The transformation of human consciousness that will be made possible by these kinds of technologies, that's what it's all about. So let's get out there and let's do this because again, how we use these tools is ultimately <laughs> what matters. So I hope that I've inspired you guys today to go create some awe with these tools and technologies and I'm pretty much out of time. So thank you guys for being here. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Wish you a beautiful day. Thank you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.